Welcome back to The Horse Race, your weekly look at politics, policy, and elections in Massachusetts. I'm Stephanie Murray here with Jennifer Smith and Steve Cazella. Hello, Hello. Stephanie. <laughs> We're all virtual still, which is exciting. And uh, this week, weirdly, marks a lot of would have beens, if not for the ripples of coronavirus, because today would have been tax day, which is now July 15th. And then Monday would have been the Boston Marathon, which is now September 14th. But it is right now still one Boston day, which is seven years after the marathon bombing. And, you know, for me, it's a little bit, a little bit strange because one Boston day is usually tied to like a weekend of public service and public space improvements and volunteering, like, you know, beautifying these local squares. And obviously that can't happen because of all the social distancing. So that's another of those smaller kind of depressing impacts day by day. The other depressing thing would be that any day would have been a day that many people might be trying to make bread, but there is now no flour or yeast. Easter was a bit of a challenge, I have to say. I mean, <clears throat> going to the grocery store and trying to, you know, bake sort of traditional enriched breads. It's like there's no enriched, or there's no evaporated milk. There's no sugar in some places. There's no flour. It's like you just kind of take whatever you can get and put it in a pan and hope. <clears throat> yeah, That's definitely. how we bake these days. Um, so I, I do have to ask the one key and hard hitting question right here at the top, which is that for some reason that we can't really describe, uh, Jen Smith and I just spent an hour plus of our lives watching Listen to Your Hearts. Um, Stephanie, could you fill in our listeners on why we did this? I am frankly surprised that you both jumped into action <laughs> at eight o'clock this morning to watch Listen to Your Heart, the Bachelor spinoff show that is about people trying to find love and also become singing sensations it's like the bachelor plus the bachelor in paradise plus um a star is born uh if you haven't seen any of those things and this makes no sense to you but it's just this kind of ridiculous new reality show that we are all watching and talking about um so i'd be interested to hear your impressions uh, as people who just watched the show a few hours ago uh, in the morning which is a bizarre time to watch it Okay, so I've got to say, this whole thing started off like a complete disaster because of how many times they referenced A Star is Born as like an iconic love story. Maybe and I don't know. 45 minutes of yeah. that movie or an iconic love story. It's like they've only seen the first 45 minutes of the Lady Gaga version of A Star is Born. But let me tell you, generations of people have watched these films and been horrifically traumatized by both the relationship and the ending so I don't know where they were going with that one. I really, guys, what if the whole thing ends like a star is born? What if it's like a horrible, like depressing, deadly twist? Uh, I have to say Would that, that make it better? <clears throat> horrible and depressing is pretty much where it started out. I don't know <laughs> if that would really be much of a twist. Um, no, I, we, I, I did watch it. There was a lot of breathiness and a lot of super, super serious drama. I mean, I take this stuff seriously. It's a quest for love and companionship. And there's just so little of that these days that just like seeing people just putting themselves out there, really trying to have authentic relationships. It just warms my heart, I have to say. Are we allowed to mute Steve's <laughs> mic when he says stuff like this? Do we have that power? Because uh, let me first say, everyone sounds the same on this show. Literally everyone. If you told me one person was in a sound booth just dubbing over every single guy singing John Mayer, I would buy it. I don't even know why they're channeling John Mayer. He's like a terrible boyfriend. Uh, yeah. That's what he's known for, uh, is being just an awful boyfriend. Um, but the characters I'm watching, in case anybody cares, are the free-spirited wild child yoga teacher and the long-haired <laughs> suburban, not suburban, long-haired Subaru owner from Texas. Those are my two. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't really know what that means, but uh, it was educational. And we, just like Stephanie and I watched, watched through Love is Blind, we're committing ourselves to watching every single week of this so we can bring you our exclusive horse race updates. Jen's eyebrows just went up and she looked like she was questioning the commitment that I just made on her behalf. Nonetheless, yeah, can we're you do that? Forward. I think I can. I think that we should, we together should make that commitment to our listeners to bring them this kind of content. I mean, it's all just kind of, again, in all seriousness, like this is the kind of thing right now that we're using to try as much as we can to kind of distance ourselves from thinking constantly about how horrible everything is because we're segue in the world. Uh, there was just a press conference again that Stephanie was watching 
with an update on how horrible everything is. So uh, where are we at right now on actual deaths, on hospitalizations? There is a pandemic happening, which is the only reason we're watching this stupid Bachelor show to begin with. So what's going on? That's right, Jen. Um, Our Bachelor viewing is merely an escape from the situation that we're all living through, which is very serious. Um, Governor Charlie Charlie Baker actually teared up um, at a press conference today on Wednesday talking about his friend's mom who passed away from coronavirus. And he said, you know, usually he's somebody who doesn't exactly say what's on his mind or really talk uh, with his family about his feelings. And he's trying to do that on the phone with his dad, who is elderly right now. And so I think that's just kind of an interesting um, or like a personal way to kind of understand how everybody's going through this. Um, Tens of thousands of cases, hundreds of deaths. Um, This is really serious and we're in the surge now. So we've got a hard day, few days and weeks ahead of us here in Massachusetts. Yeah, and on the on the data side of it as well, I was kind of paying loose attention to the press conference. It was kind of interesting. They're going to be doing uh, COVID-19 cases by city and town reporting. That's right. And this is kind of a, it's been an issue since the reporting started. So at first, the state only announced cases, I think it was on a weekly basis, and then they moved to daily, but it was county by county and nothing else. Um, and that was something Secretary Mary Lou Sutters said was to protect people from being cyber bullied or to protect their privacy because there were still so few cases that it would be easy to identify the people who had been tested positive for coronavirus. But as the caseload started to get larger, here comes this issue of how do we balance privacy with people operating under maybe a false sense of security that the coronavirus is not in their city and town when it actually is. So cities and towns have been operating kind of on a patchwork basis. Some say how many cases they have. A lot of towns don't. um, And it depends on region, uh, on town, on the size of the town, on who's in charge of the Board of Health. Um, So that's all going away as of today. The state's going to start announcing cases by city and town every Wednesday. And the only exception is if there are fewer than five cases in a town that is smaller than 50,000 people. So that'll be some more data that we get um, moving forward. Sounds like we're also going to start getting better data by race and ethnicity. Uh, That's something that that had been requested by a lot of people just because there was uh, evidence from elsewhere that this has been hitting particularly black and Hispanic residents harder than it's been hitting white residents. Um, I I saw the first of those charts come out just a few days, Stephanie, but are we going to start, is that another improvement that's coming or or are we going to keep seeing like half of the cases not really being able to be classified? I think it's hard to tell right now. Um, When the data first came out, the forms that were kind of recording the cases on didn't require them to put race or ethnicity data on the form and now people are required to so I think like it'll it will never be as complete as if those were required from the get-go but at least anecdotally and even just looking regionally on a map um, it's really clear that the virus is hitting communities of color particularly hard I mean you just have to look at Chelsea where the city's on a 24-hour lockdown or a stay-at-home curfew advisory because so many people have the virus, which is, which is awful. Can we pivot really quickly to a totally weird news cycle right now about whether or not there's a mutiny happening? Anyone? Anyone? Trump tweeted about like the Democratic governors uh, reminding him about mutiny on the bounty. The movie. Yeah, that was another one of those old, you know, tw- Trump cultural references where he pulls something out of the 60s and 70s, like when he called Pete Buttigieg, it was like Alfred P. Newman or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and he, he's got these every now and then something just sort of gets that gets pulled from the archives. But what he seemed to be trying to say was that um, was that governors were going their own way in a way, to a degree that he didn't appreciate, which obviously I think to anybody paying even casual attention to the law, the governors are all acting well within the bounds of their authority. And, and Trump's assertion that he has the authority to reopen the economy has no relationship to any known legal theory. Uh, but even so, he... Um, seems to be taking exception to the ways both that they're acting individually and then they're also seem to be banding together which is quite interesting and all of these cultural references are usually over my head but um i think our new cultural reference will be a reporter asking charlie baker uh are you part of a mutiny at a press briefing which uh would have been crazy to us i think even six weeks ago but 
Uh, now it's perfectly uh, a valid question because the president is talking about it. So basically what's going on is uh, a bunch of states in the Northeast are banding together to kind of create this regional partnership. It's led by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and then uh, Massachusetts joined on a couple of days ago. It includes Rhode Island, um, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut. I'm probably forgetting a couple, but that's kind of the, the mutiny that Trump was talking about was that uh, governors would, uh, lost my train of thought, that governors would decide to reopen or not reopen the economy in their states, uh, not under his, his guidance, but of their own. Yeah, it's been interesting watching it because, of course, I'm a West Coast native and what's happening out on the West Coast is there's also a partnership out there with California, Oregon, and Washington. And uh, it's really kind of becoming clearer and clearer out here um, on, the, on the East Coast just because the states are so small and so jammed together. Like, um, I think it was Governor Raimondo of Rhode Island um, was saying the reality is the virus doesn't care about state borders and our response shouldn't either. Like, if you're dealing with a place as small as Rhode Island, you kind of have to factor in all of the states surrounding it. So that's being, uh, that's been kind of interesting to keep an eye on, especially uh, what should be noted as well. Charlie Baker is kind of in a weird unique position here as the only Republican governor of any of these state coalitions um, that's kind of talking about the need to reopen it. And there's always sort of been that tension between him and the National Republican Party uh, under Trump. And he's walking a fine line here because President Donald Trump has said himself that governors who criticize him or who he doesn't really get along with, he's not going to reach out to them. He'll have Mike Pence or somebody else do it, but uh, he's not going to be as interested in sending supplies or things like that to states uh, who have governors who defy him. So it's, it's not just an ideological issue. It, it could be a really tangible equipment issue. Yeah, which is, of course is a... Um... <clears throat> outrageous affront to every duty that a president is supposed to supposed to hold. Um, but for that, uh, with, with that, we need to move on to, to, to another issue, which is which is rapidly becoming something that's that uh, that we're all going to be talking about and all, all facing as we move on to the to the recovery phase. Um, and that, of course, is transportation. Um, after that, we're actually going to have one of our good friends, George Cronin, here here, who's our our resident ballot question expert here at the horse race, to talk about signature issues and how um, the the requirement to gather literally thousands more signatures just in the next few months could upend some of the ballot cam ballot uh, ballot questions that are that may be headed for the ballot here in 2020. Um, but for now, let's talk transportation. Let's go. So the coronavirus pandemic pretty much brought the economy to a halt. Non-essential workers are staying home, which means they're not driving or taking public transportation like the MBTA. Roads are empties, T ridership is cratered. I mean, looking forward, questions are just abounding. So what does the lost revenue mean? How will people change their transportation patterns as the crisis fades? When will that fade? Will people be willing to get back on a train when this is all over? And I mean, we're all just staying home now, but what happens after this? I think it's an interesting question, and I wonder if people are not going to be interested in taking public transportation that is so crowded right after social distancing ends. We've seen in Wuhan, China, that consumers, now that the lockdown is lifted, they're out buying cars, some of them because they don't want to get on public transportation, or maybe they feel like they would like to leave, and when the trains shut down in the city, they couldn't get out. So I think this is a really tough problem for transportation advocates. If people in Massachusetts are to buy more cars, just as they were starting to get people to think about taking their cars off the road to reduce congestion. Yeah, it kind of comes at a moment when the transportation policy debate was coming to a head. You know, we were, we'd been building up to it, I think, for a while. The last uh, piece of legislation, significant piece of transportation le legislation was passed in 2013. And there were signs and signals and comments from from both legislative leaders and the governor that there was something that was getting ready to happen on transportation. Um, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, the regional gas import fee scheme um, that some of the Northeast states had were looking at, that was 
headed somewhere. We weren't totally sure exactly where. Um, but now all of that's been basically upended. And I think it's it's very difficult to know where exactly the the transportation debate goes from here. I think the, the ambiguities extend to how much money the transportation system has. It extends to what modes people will prefer to use. It extends to what kinds of taxes or fees residents might be open to and legislative leaders might be open to. So I, I just don't think there's any clarity on where the transportation debate goes from here. Yeah, to your point, Steve, the House just passed that big transportation bill at the beginning of March, which, what was that, like 50 years ago at this point? That's, it's nuts. But uh, that, that bill itself was going to raise about half a billion dollars through new taxes and fees. But now there's the kind of other question about what do you do with state leaders saying we don't want to have any new taxes right now? I mean, at some point, the state's going to need more money. So maybe this conversation about no new taxes might evolve. But right now, it's it's no new taxes, no nothing. The transportation debate is really kind of taking a second or a, a backseat to the budget crisis that's going on and just the legislature managing the coronavirus crisis itself. But um, I spoke with Chris Dempsey, who is the director of transportation for Massachusetts, which is like a coalition of transit advocates. And he was saying that they're hoping to kind of get stuff into the budget or into the um, the transportation bond bill, which still needs to pass. Um, so instead of kind of getting this big sweeping piece of transportation legislation, like many of them were hoping for, maybe there will be some other ways to kind of get, get their stuff in there. But it's just the road forward, no pun intended, is really unclear. Well, that's the, that's the thing, kind of to the earlier point that you were bringing up is the trade-off of folks, for instance, not taking the T is that they're driving more. We already have terrible gridlock here in Massachusetts. So I'm, I'm always really interested, uh, you know, Steve, for instance, you uh, love tweeting out the pictures of the traffic grids and what it suddenly looks like when suddenly there's a pandemic and no one's on the roads. So what does it look like when we're still kind of coming out of it so people might be leery about taking public transit but now everyone just wants to drive everywhere yeah that's a great question and i think we don't really know the answer we spent a lot of years figuring out why people would get on the t and why people would choose their car and just what made them choose different modes in a stable situation but um, adding in public health concerns is something that i don't think anybody really knows what the impact of that will be um, and and then the the demand for cars is another is unknown whether the same thing that happened in, in wuhan will happen here um, but then the other thing i think that we don't know for sure is what the economic impact will be and what it will have what uh, impact that will have on traffic. So for instance, if we are going to see 20% unemployment, it's going to take a long time to fade. Uh, that will decrease the amount of cars that are on the road and that will make the urgency of expanding the MBTA and doing things to reduce congestion appear to be less. So one of the reasons why our, our congestion had gotten so bad is that the economy was so, so hot in Boston. You know, again, that feels like 200 years ago now, but if, if we really do see this massive contraction in productivity and employment, then that will also have an impact just on the number of cars on the road. So lots of unknowns, I think. Yeah, and also the T has no money now is the awkward yeah. context. Uh, they expect to lose $230 million in revenue this year. Um, I mean, I don't know if you guys were looking through those numbers. The WBUR article on it broke it down um, in a way that I found very dramatic and kind of traumatizing. And uh, it's as of April 9th, subway ridership was down 92.7%. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, and it's that, that number makes a lot of sense because nobody's going, or I shouldn't say nobody, very few people are going to work and those who are going to work can easily drive into Boston at this point. It's been very interesting, I think, to, to realize how small our region actually is. Uh, you can just pop over to towns that usually would be a 45 minute drive because you realize they're only three miles or five miles away, you know, so uh, people are doing that, which also I think is why the YT ridership's so low. And there's just no common surfaces if you just drive somewhere. Exactly. And I think that what might happen is going to be larger than what's just going on in Massachusetts. Like Ford is already talking about doing another cash for clunkers program, you know, that 2008, 2009 um, 
stimulus to help out the auto industry. Ray LaHood, who was the person who kind of spearheaded that, is already talking about um, doing another Cash for Conquerors program. Not that it was super successful back then, but they might do another one now. Um, and it's, it's tough to see how the T and public transportation competes with that. I mean, in other parts of the world, this has been able to be handled, like in Japan or other places with really crowded public transportation systems, they've been able to keep caseloads low and to do tracing and testing. But it's just, I think the, the psyche of getting onto a crowded train is going to be tough for people when things start to lift, not forever, but when things start to change back to sort of normal. Yeah, and the, the, the thing that the legislature then has to deal with is it's not just the immediate, you know, because of course it's transportation. So what the, where things take years and decades to put into place. So what you would like to do, what you'd like to see done is that they would think about where they want to go, not just where we are right now, which may, in my view, require them to think a bit down the road, a bit down the track, whatever metaphor we want to use, and think about what kind of transportation system we want and what system we'll wish we had when employment gets back to 3%, because eventually it'll get back there. And if we just uh, shut everything down and think, you know, we don't have any money right now, we can't do anything right now, everything's bad, then we'll all be regretting it, I think, when we get back to that point. Um, so anyway, a lot, a lot ahead there, but right now we have our good friend, George Cronin on the line, who's here to talk to us about signatures. Uh, George, are you there? George, are you there? Yes, Steve, hello. All right, good to see you. Likewise. The necessary but decidedly unglamorous task of signature gathering doesn't, gen doesn't generally gin up much, much attention. But in the age of coronavirus and social, social isolation, how do candidates for public office acquire enough signatures when door knocking is not an option? Ballot question organizers face an even bigger challenge, needing tens of thousands of signatures to make it onto the ballot. Here to tell us how they're faring, we have our good friend, Rasky Partners Public Affairs Manager Director and prize-winning professor of petition processes, George Cronin. George, thank you for being, thank you for being here. Thanks, Steve. It's good to be here. It's always good to be here. Um, so ballot question organizers still, even at this point, need a pile of signatures to make it to the ballot. So just, just for those of us who don't follow the process as closely as you do, walk us through what, where we are right now in the whole uh, series of steps that have to, have to, have to happen. There's four initiative petitions right now that are working their way through the legislative process that could become ballot questions in November. And in terms of process right now, the legislature has until May 6th to act on the initiative petitions. If they take no action, then the proponents of those initiative petitions have to go out and gather another round of signatures. And it's, it's a pretty extensive um, requirement. They'll need 13,000 signatures by July 1st. And there are four potential ballot questions that we're looking at right now. Uh, what's your read at this point on any of them that might face a particular struggle given this kind of signature requirement? The ones who are um, well organized in, in any situation are the ones that will be successful. I think it remains, um, it's unknown how these four will um, fare with the signature requirement. There had been some chatter a while back as to whether or not um, it might be permissible to use signatures that may have been gathered during the previous um, round and apply those to the next round, but they can't do that. They have to go out and get a fresh round of 13,000 signatures. So that, that's, a, that, that's a high hurdle and it will be a, a test um, with regard to who's organized. I think if you look at the four, um, the right to repair, they've showed in the past that they've got some organizational strength. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not the proponents of the rank choice voting could, could do what they need to do. Um, unclear what the nursing homes are capable of. And we've seen in the past or, or, or some semblance of organization within um, the convenience store um, constituency. So they may have the ability to get those signatures. But again, it's a, tough, it's a, it's a high hurdle. Have you seen any hints as to which campaigns might be more organized than the others? I mean, TV was just inundated with these right to repair ads a few months ago or maybe a month ago. I don't have any track of time anymore, but it seems like those have backed off a little bit. Do you, does that show you hesitance uh, or reluctance to spend money right now because of the hurdles that are ahead or 
um, I guess just which, which campaigns do you think will make it to the ballot? Just to handicap the four, um, right to repair folks are pretty well organized. The right choice voting folks have the potential. They've got grassroots support. The question is whether or not they can put together a statewide operation to get the signatures. The big unknown is the nursing homes. Um, and we're not really sure what the convenience does, the proponents of, of that alcohol license one. I'd, I'd say the right to repair folks are probably um, best positioned. It seems too like there'd be a, there'd be some safety issues that would go throughout the process. I mean, you've got the actual people responsible for gathering the signatures. Then they, of course, have to turn them into the town clerks and then to the secretary of state's office. So it seems like there's a number of safety issues that that would. Sorry, would everybody like to see Rosalie here? <laughs> Rosalie has joined us on the podcast. Um, it seemed like there'd be a number of safety issues that would extend uh, to to people sort of throughout the process. That's right. And, you know, I think it speaks to the whole topic, Steve, we've discussed this, this in the past, the topic of voter contact, the challenges that campaigns have had the last few cycles about how to open a line of communication and maintain a line of communication, and even how to open a line of communication and make a meaningful contact with somebody for a survey research purposes. So that whole, the challenge of voter contact has kind of um, transferred over into the whole issue of ballot access. How do, how do campaigns, not only the ballot question campaigns, but how do the candidate campaigns get the signatures that are required to get on the ballot in this environment? And that's, that's the large unknown. And the conversations we've had, um, so folks are doing it a different, different, a number of different ways. And it seems to suggest that um, people who have the ability to tap into an organization are, are gonna be the ones that have the most success incumbents, obviously. If you are a, a, a staffer in a legislative office and you're running for your boss's open seat, that, that suggests that there's some organization right there. If you are a municipal office holder who's running for a state office, then that suggests that there's some organizational strength there too. So it it's really comes down to um, in these new uncertain, um, untraditional ways of gathering signatures, who's gonna be able to put the organization together to do that. So what are you watching right now as we kind of move into and through the signature gathering phase? Um, at what point would you feel confident about any particular ballot initiatives chances? Or is that something that you'd kind of be watching for an organizational structure and then just see what actually makes it onto the table? There are folks who specialize in signature gathering. There are vendors who help these ballot question campaigns. They'll go to supermarkets, they'll go to post offices, and they'll get these signatures. So at some point, we'll know um, which of these ballot questions makes the decision to use those vendors. That, that's, that's a big key. The other thing on the candidate side, there's some efforts to reduce the signature requirements. There was a bill that was discussed in the Senate last week that would cut in half the signature requirements for the federal office, the Senate, Congress, the county, and the governor's council. That, that, that would be interesting to watch that they left, or at least the current proposal leaves the legislative requirements, signature requirements for the state house and Senate in place at 300 for the Senate and 150 for the house. So logistically, when you can't go to the grocery store to go collect signatures, how, how do you do it? You know, I was talking to a candidate for state representative who called people and then his campaign would go drop the papers off at their house and then go pick them up. Uh, but that was for about 200 signatures that he ended up turning in, not uh, 13,000 or whatever it is. So how, what are the steps to do that safely? It's kind of run the gamut. If you look on social media, people are getting really creative. They're leaving. Um, some folks are putting um, a table in front of their house with a sign up sheet on it and they're um, tweeting out instructions on how to do that. They're leaving tables in front of town halls. And, and you know, it's, it's, we, we've even heard people putting um, nomination papers through the door slot, waiting for the signature and then to take it back. So it um, takes a little creativity and, and it's a whole new world. And is that, do you think that there's any, any possibility that the legislature would, tr would look to address signature requirements for ballot questions like they are for, for candidates, or is 13,000 going to be what, what needs to be done? It's been silent so far on the ballot question. There's been a back and forth on the requirements for the candidates. The governor has spoken out on it. The Senate has kind of taken a position. The House has, has remained 
quiet, but um, we haven't heard anything on the ballot question front. Sorry, folks, my uh, mic just went out for a second. Can someone else take that? <laughs> oh. uh, go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I mean, we've seen in other states that they've been able to do a lot more than Massachusetts has done in terms of signature gathering for ballot initiatives and just for campaigns. Do you know why or do you have a guess at why it's taken Massachusetts longer than other places? I mean, out west, California, um, Oregon, I believe, or Washington, other states that do vote by mail or are suspending signatures. I think some, something similar has happened in Virginia. Why, are, why is our state moving more slowly? I don't know if it's moving slowly. I think it's just a question of where the focus and the priority is. I think there's a lot of, a lot of discussion on the candidate side. Um, there's actually, there's a, there's a court case that's gonna be heard before the SJC, I think it's tomorrow. So there's, there has been some focus on the candidate side. We're, we're, we're starting to hear a lot more discussion about vote by, vote by mail. Um, for whatever reason, the, the initiative petitions and the ballot questions just um, haven't been part of the discussion yet. Do you think there's any alterations that would need to happen if there was some kind of major shift over to a vote by mail initiative? Would there still be difficulties in kind of reaching prospective voters and signatories? That's a good question. I think it comes down to logistics and security, and I know those discussions are taking place. I, I believe there was a, a hearing order filed on the Boston City Council this week, so there'll be a discussion there, and, and, and we're starting to hear more discussions uh, at the State House about that. The other thing that kind of piques my interest as the economy takes such a nosedive is fundraising for cam candidates and for ballot campaigns. You know, these cost a lot of money, the ads cost money. Getting signatures sounds like it's going to cost more money than usual. I mean, do you suspect that donations might start to whittle down as people don't see much income coming in? I think it's inevitable that, that campaigns are going to see a decline in contributions, partly because the elimination of physical fundraising and partly because of the economy. What we're starting to see is um, some campaigns are doing virtual fundraising, particularly the bigger campaigns, the presidential campaigns. Um, and I think we'll start to see that. Um, I've received over the last couple of weeks cancellation notices for folks that were gonna do fundraisers um, up on Beacon Hill and in the absence of the physical event or tribute online. So I think we'll see more and more virtual gathering and more and more virtual fundraising events. So the, um, looking then at the chances that the four questions would have or uh, which ones might pass, might not pass, do, is it too early at the moment to, to make any prognostications about, about which ones might have a good chance of passing? Um, or can we start to, start to say which ones of these might, might become law either through the legislature or at the ballot box? It's premature to try to speculate which ones would pass on the ballot. I think the next order of business would be to, to make a determination or just to make an assessment as to which ones um, are best positioned and equipped to handle that 13,000 signature hurdle. And once they make it to the ballot um, and it becomes a campaign and it gets a number and advertising is spent on both sides, we'll have a better sense of, of how things are going to go. Well, this is certainly something we'll be keeping an eye on. So George Cronin of Rasky Partners, thank you so much for joining us virtually today. Great, thank you. And this brings us to trivia, which we did not have last week, but Stephanie found a really good one for us this week. So take it away. This is a fun one. So Boston got a new health commissioner named William Crichton Woodward from Washington, D.C. He came to Boston from Washington, D.C. just before the flu of 1918 hit the city and it, it was all a mess before he could even unpack his boxes from moving um, because the city became a hot spot for the flu the second time it came around. Uh, so none of those are the trivia question, but here's what it is. He made a lot of rules to combat the spread of the flu, including closing down non-essential public places, just like we're seeing now. What was the first order that William Crichton Woodward ordered in Boston? What was the first rule he put in place? That's the question. Mm, that's a good one. I bet it's like happy hour or something. <laughs> Just very Puritan and very Boston. Yeah, no you alcohol <laughs> in uh, grocery stores. <laughs> like whatever oh the reason gosh. is, just ban alcohol. You know, we don't, that'll help for sure. Don't do that to me, Steve. 
<laughs> I have to watch The Bachelor listen to your heart. I need my alcohol. <laughs> there was actually a, a, a Boston Globe op-ed about banning alcohol during this. And I thought that, uh, what, what? I mean, I, I was you lost for words, much like I am now. Oh, man. But uh, at any rate, that's about all the time we have for today, even though, as usual, once again, we didn't actually talk about all of the national stuff that's going on right now. Can we just note quickly that apparently, like, the entire Democratic Party has now coalesced? Yes, and Elizabeth Warren is the latest person to endorse Joe Biden. I think we're only waiting on AOC now, which is an interesting (laughs) way that the dominoes fell. Yeah, exactly, that order of it. So maybe at some point we'll talk about that again, but for now... That's it. I'm Jennifer Smith. I'm Stephanie Murray. And I'm Steve Cazella. Our producer, as always, is the great Libby Gormley. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe to our pod wherever you get your podcasts and leave us ratings and reviews. Subscribe to Stephanie Murray's Massachusetts uh, Political Playbook and call us if you need polls. Um, But for now, thank you all so much for listening and we will see you next week.